Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Dawn Richardson and this video is going to be about the Ascension. A quick personal comment which is that I had intended to record this and release it on May 25th which uh, coincides with the day that Ascension is observed on the Christian calendar. Um, but I got the guidance this morning and um, it is Friday. It's actually 11 11 a.m. right now when I'm starting and it is Friday May the um, 12th. Um, and uh, my guidance was to do this this morning so I'm going with it um, I had actually intended to do a little more research but I guess they just want me to talk from my heart and that's what I will do here so this video will be about Ascension um, the Ascension of Jesus and how that is a model for our Ascension and I believe we are all invited to partake of um, walking in the way of wholeness and moving into um, a deeper, truer, higher understanding of who we are in these human vessels um, and uh, to come into that reunion, that inner reunion with ourselves. So in this video, like a little bit of an overview, and I may put time signatures below if this video goes a little long so that you can jump to sections that you would like to or come back to this video. So we will cover a little bit of the definition of ascension, what, you know, what is ascension uh, in general, and what was the ascension of Jesus. Um, I'll share some, uh, some information on that, and then, you know, including uh, how uh, the ascension was described in uh, the writings that we have. Um, and then I will also talk about my view on the process that led up to the ascension of Jesus. Um, you know, in the Christian tradition, if you heard of the ascension at all, it was likely that just an attacked on afterthought. And then Jesus went up in the clouds and returned to God in heaven. So I'm going to give a little bit more of my view on that based on um, my own understanding and my own remembrance, my soul's remembrance of that time. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, the true meaning of Jesus' ascension and why it matters for us, like why why that is important. Hold on just a sec. <clears throat> hmm. I'm going to do this. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, also, on a personal note, it's interesting, I was... Um, <laughs> they were quite particular about this. I was guided to put on this necklace, uh, which I actually have um, not worn in many years. Um, okay, they're telling me to share this with you. So I, I, um, all of you who follow me know how much I love Jesus and how you know He's been with me from the beginning, and how you know that is um, that is an integral part of every part of my life to include this process of understanding the whole of who I am and returning to my whole self and my soul self. Um, this particular little necklace that I have on, I bought, oh gosh, I don't wanna get emotional here at the beginning, but they want me to share this. Um, I um, went through a long, three decades long, um, you know, 30 years of my life, not being whole, literally, you know, have, being going through life essentially with a disintegrated personality um, and um, lots of splits and divisions that manifest uh, man manifested in you know in my body um, in in my heart at times in my mind um, most definitely and um, lastly in, in my spirit um, and I bought this necklace um, to symbolize a new beginning after what I came to refer to as my great healing which um, happened I believe it was the summer of 1998 I always get the years confused because those years were very difficult but um, it was it was an amazing miracle to me and I write about this in journey to sacred wholeness my memoir which was written at that time so I would I would speak it differently but if you want to read the process of you know from where I was then you can you can uh, find that in that book journey to sacred wholeness um, but I bought this um, because it was truly a miracle and I was, it was like being, it was like being born again. And I had had the experience, um, you know, most definitely all my life of um, knowing that I could return to, um, I could, you know, kind of go to, um, that was my rock, you know, my faith um, was always there. Um, and not my faith in religion. I want to be very clear about that. For me, it was always internal. Um, it was always my faith in 
the person of Jesus and in, in because he was with me in spirit and within in me <laughs> in me he lived in me and um, so this great healing that occurred this you know miraculous integration and wholeness that happened in this most amazing way I was extremely um, blessed and I wanted to share that and I wanted to begin again and and right any wrongs that I had done and and uh, some of that did have to do with my divine counterpart um, and other parts of it had to do with you know other situations um, but I was still um, my heart was very pure um, and yet there was a lot of there were a lot of missing gaps and so I, I began wearing this and then um, within a month of um, all of of my great healing and, and all of that unfolding was when um, the church asked me to leave and a variety of other things happened that were a complete like it was like multiple towers fell at once after all my life had felt like a tower you know so it was um it was quite traumatic for me and I've, I've spoken to that elsewhere um so I I was wearing this during that month and I was so bewildered and dismayed. I remember um, I was trying to save like, I think it was $40 or $50, some kind of ridiculously small amount, but I was a single mom and I had had a couple of difficult years in terms of pulling myself together. And um, and I was trying to save this small amount to be able to go on this um, women's retreat that our church was offering. And uh, I had written uh, my my book to to the best of my ability in terms of that journey I had made, and I knew that there was a promise of something beautiful that was unfolding in me, and I knew that I was walking in the footsteps that Jesus had walked in, um, and I I remembered a good bit. I didn't talk about it often, you know, because um, I frankly I didn't I didn't want to. <laughs> anybody else to suggest I belonged in a, in a mental institution because I knew I did not and I knew that I knew what I knew and I was going to um, hold on to that and um, yet um, a series of events unfolded as I mentioned and it, it was extremely uh, you know like uh, it was as if I was being you know tossed about in this whirlwind um, and I, I often describe that period of my life as my uh, second shattering because I had this month of complete and utter wholeness like I had never seen the world like this you all and it's it's I believe you know having come you know this next 20 years since then that um, <laughs> don't ever take this world and its beauty for granted Okay, so I'm on a little bit of a tangent and I want to get back to the purpose of this video, which is ascension. But I guess I guess that's why they wanted me to share it, because even at that point when everything felt shattered um, and my my faith um, in 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 God and through through Jesus and and his continued presence with me and all that my soul knew and remembered um, I was able to, you know, continue to, you know, get up every day. And I spent years in, after that in, in silence or sitting in my backyard, you know, seeking God, essentially. And there were um, many challenges in terms of, um, you know, what I now see, I really do believe, were attacks by the dark and other kinds of um, events that are you know frankly quite inexplicable in human terms but in, in any case um through all of it the one thing that i held on to was attempting to walk you know forward in the way of wholeness but this necklace that so i haven't worn it i don't believe um i think the last time i wore it was probably 2000 2001 because i had a, you know the, these series of events that these hellish kind of experiences and years um, and then I guess with the um, pre 9-11 um, I encountered Muhammad Atta who was the accused um, who flew one of the planes into the World Trade Center um, or was was purported to have done so so um, that it shook me um, to my core and so I guess why they wanted me to share that perhaps and why they wanted me to put this on was Perhaps there's something there in terms of just that through, you know, so that this ascension process was actually unfolding all of that time too. But I couldn't see that. I lost 
my, I didn't lose my faith in, in uh, God, but I lost my way. Um, and I thought I was no longer on the way when essentially I was um, being held in that infinite grace in which we all are held. And I was still belonging to God. So I think that maybe um, I will g I'll give some further reflection to that, but uh, they, they wanted me to mention that. So, um, okay, so let's get into the video about ascension. Um, so sorry for the 10 minute introduction. Um, the definition of ascension, what is ascension? So the dictionary says that ascension is the act of rising to an important position or a higher level. So to ascend. Um, one of the, I, I did look at a few websites uh, last week just to see what other people, how they defined ascension. Um, and as we know, there are lots of variations out there, but um, I would say that um, Sandra Walter has a very succinct definition that I think most would resonate with, with, which is that ascension is a conscious choice to engage in evolution. Um, so essentially, ascension, when we look at it in terms of soul growth, which I talk about a lot, and spiritual evolution, it, to me it is about understanding who we are beyond our physical human form, this body that is the vessel for our whole self and our soul self. So, and not just understanding it, actually, not understanding it here. When I say understanding, I mean beyond knowledge, beyond our limited mind function. It is something that is um, essentially who we are, um, and it's a resting in that and a surrender to it and allowing that to raise us up, allowing ourselves to be raised up as Jesus was raised up. Um, so you might say that ascension has a lot to do with the resurrection of what is true and the falling away, the death to all that is not true, to the true self, to our whole self, our soul self. So all that is not of God, all that is not um, of our true nature um, is left behind. So that's my understanding of ascension. And I really encourage all of you watching this video to uh, give this some thought in terms of your own view and your own understanding. So the ascension of Jesus. In the Christian tradition, ascension, uh, what is called ascension, is it's a movable feast, which means it, the day that it happens or is observed changes based on the year. Um, but it's 40 days after Easter. And that is because for 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus was here on earth and he appeared many times to uh, his closest followers and then to uh, a large groups of people at um at points along the way. And then 40 days after Easter was, uh, were the events of the Ascension. And I'll read some of what that was specifically. Um, a, a few other things to know about my own understanding. So God is to me the very current of life and love. Uh, it's God is the source of all that is. And therefore, it, God is the key to me coming to see myself rightly. And so as I have stated elsewhere, I don't think it's um, accurate to say that it is incompatible to believe in God, the creator, or the creative life force, and to be on a path of ascension. Um, I am most certainly ascending into the fullness of who I am, which is essentially an unveiling, and I often refer to it as the revelation of a mystery. Uh, and I also believe in God, who we can understand as mother, father, creator God. We can understand that as the spirit of truth that moves through this life and God as what makes us one, our common source, our, our shared um, nature um, and the truth of who we are. And then the resplendent display of that in all of these varieties of expression of the divine. And that's the beauty of who we are. So those are, that's a little bit about my understanding. I also believe that Jesus came to earth to walk in this world to show us the way. And he was the way, the truth, and the life, all in all, made complete when he returned to the place within him where he and the Father, Mother, Creator were one. 
So Jesus made the journey to radiant realization of who he was by walking through that deep valley, you know, the shadow of death. He walked through that. Make no mistake, he did not come down to earth and just, um, you know, I am God and just exist here as some superior being. No, no. He faced everything. He walked through that deep valley. He faced the ego temptations in the wilderness. And by saying yes to the will of God, where he said, not my will, but thine be done, despite all the costs to him personally and to those he loved. So he allowed God's spirit of healing and grace to flow through him and to purify his body, his mind, and his spirit. He embraced his humanity, but he did not give himself over to it. That's an important po point right there. I think that's really key. So remember that when I share some of the scripture passages, remember this. I don't think, I think we are often, that part is glossed over or not addressed at all in, um, in churches, but also by true believers. We, f we forget that Jesus was fully human. He didn't deny any of that. But he also did not use it as an excuse or just give himself over to the desires or passions um, or, um, or uh, the, the human uh, way of doing things. Um, so though he was one with God and was God in the beginning, he was with God and he was God. He humbled himself and he was in full service and surrender to God. There's a passage I do want to read you um, that Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2. It's one of the most beautiful in all of the New Testament. And it describes Jesus this way. It says, Jesus, you know, Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, no, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Consider that. And there's something there for us. So let's look at um, how Jesus' ascension was described by various texts through the years. So John, the Gospel of John, um, is one of um, my um, favorite tellings of the stories of Jesus. So let's look at that. Chapter 14, Jesus um, himself foretells of his ascension. He says he is going to prepare a place for the disciples. So that, and he's, this is the passage where he's saying, my peace, I leave you and, and I'm going. And the disciples are just beginning to understand, you know, holy smokes, he's, he's not just going off and, you know, on a little trip somewhere like he was known to do. No, this is something different. And he talks about returning to the father. And then in the resurrection story in the gospel of John in chapter 20, verses 17 to 19, you know, Mary Magdalene stands outside the tomb. She has seen the, the, the stone has been rolled away and Jesus is not there. And she, she thinks somebody has moved the body, has stolen the body. Um, and she's standing outside the tomb, weeping, sobbing, really. And Jesus says, he, she touches him. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene then went to the disciples with the news and says, I have seen the Lord. And she told him, told the disciples that were gathered, the other disciples, what um, he had said to her. So notice that this Jesus says, I am ascending. There's a process implied. I am ascending. I have not yet ascended. Um, and, and then tells Mary to go and, and tell the others. Also in John chapter 16, 
Um, Jesus says, I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. The, the term Father is used in Scripture. Um, I do believe myself that um, Jesus may have used that term, but always saw the balanced um, that God was both uh, male and female, masculine and feminine um, energies made up God. So um, those are a few of the passages from uh, the Gospel of John. Also in Matthew 28, um, this is often called in Christian tradition, the Great Commission. Um, so um, I'll just read um, chapter 28. I'll start verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then Jesus is, uh, is ascended. Um, in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, so I'm, I'm sharing this to show you that all of the written record we have agrees that there was an ascension. So in Mark uh, chapter 16, um, now these verses were added. Um, the earliest manuscripts do not have these verses, but essentially it is the same story. There are 11, they were eating, and um, Jesus comes to rebuke them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he says, go into all the world, and he gives the same uh, general command um, and says that, um, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink the deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So that was the Gospel of Mark. Um, I want to say um, just briefly that um, for those of you who are not familiar with, with um, the biblical tradition, that indeed um, there were miracles reported in the early days, and uh, those early believers did absolutely drive out demons and speak in tongues and pick up snakes with their hands and uh, dr drink deadly poison that, and not hurt and heal the sick. So in the, from the very beginning, they fulfilled exactly what Jesus did. It did say that that um, that the signs would accompany those who believe. Um, I just wanted to put a little aside that we have lost that um, quite a bit, and the church actually perpetuates a belief that we somehow um, are not capable of things these things uh, without being in the fold, and that is not at all what Jesus taught. Um, Luke chapter 24, one of my um, the most beautiful stories after the resurrection is on the road to Emmaus. There are two disciples who were headed to a place, a village called Emmaus, and they were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself came and walked with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked, you know, hey, what are you talking about? And they stood still with their faces downcast. And one of them, Cleopas, said, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened? And, you know, what things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And then they tell the story of what happened with, you know, the chief priests condemning him, his death, the resurrection, um, the reporting, and... Uh, and then they, they finish uh, speaking and they say, you know, um, and then we came and, and, the, and the disciples found the tomb just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And then Jesus says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. And then he, he preaches a little bit to them and then he breaks bread with them um, and gives thanks. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? 
they got up and they returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 disciples gathered and they uh, said, you know, it is true, the Lord is alive. And they, they speak about what uh, has happened. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened and they thought they had seen a ghost. Um, and, you know, he, he calms them, he gives them some fish, um, and they, um, are, they give him some fish, and he eats the fish. And so, again, like, there's, he's in his human body. And, you know, so they are, I'm, I'm sharing this passage to, to help you see that there was this transition. He was, you know, he was physical form, and he was ascending, and he was appearing on the road to Emmaus and to the disciples behind locked doors. Um, so this was the process that Jesus went through. And uh, he leads them out in the direction of Bethany. He lifts up his hands and blesses them. While he was blessing them, this is verse 51, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So another um, another story of how the ascension um, happened. And again, um, this was... Um, a process over these 40 days. Excuse me. Um, in Acts chapter 1, um, let's see, Jesus ascended after he appeared to the disciples a number of times. So um, the last time he appeared, they asked him, Would you, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So immediately after, the Bible says, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So that's some of the, the passages that are in the traditional scriptures, the Bible, as we have it, the can canonized Bible. Um, and there are other historical references um, to ascension. So um, let me talk a little bit about the process. Okay, because again, the even the biblical record, it sounds very, you know, he went up into heaven, the he went up in the clouds, you know, um, and it, it sounds very sudden. So, but Jesus said, I am ascending. And he talked during his ministry often about returning to the Father and the I and the Father are one and that that was the state into which he was moving. And it was always, he was always on the way with it himself. So he was being, he was God. He was perfect, if you want to use that word. He was, you know, whole. But he was on his way to the full, the radiant realization of that during his life and his ministry. And that is the way that is always opening up that he talks about. This is what we are invited to do ourselves. So first in the process, uh, Jesus spoke, um, Jesus came to earth and spoke often about this with a clear mission. So there are so many things said about, you know, why he came that he himself said or that those very close to him said about his mission. Here's just a few. I'm going to run down a few of those um, things that were said. Um, that they might have life and have it to the full. That's John 10, 10. That he came to fulfill the law, Matthew 5, 17. He came to seek and save that which was lost. That's Luke 19, 10 and Matthew 18, 11. In Mark 10, 45, he came not to be served, but to serve. Um, in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, John 14, 9, and 1 John 5, he says um, he came to reveal who God is through the embodiment of God. He says similar things to that. So in other words, he is revealing the nature of God in physical form, embodying God. Um, in Hebrews 10, 9, to do the will of God. John 18, 37, to testify to truth. To destroy the works of the devil. That was 1 John 3, 8. Hebrews 2, 14. John 14, 30. And several other places. Um, in Matthew 3, 11 to 12, it says, um, He came to bring the unquenchable fire of the Holy Spirit that will burn up the chaff. 
to bring judgment to those who do not see. I'm sorry, to bring judgment so those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. John 9, 39, there's an implication in several things Jesus said that he came basically to flip, flip the story, right? To uh, expose, to, you know, it's quite revolutionary in many ways. Okay, I'll, I'll stay with those scriptures. Um, in 1 Peter 2, 24, Hebrews 9, 28, and Matthew 20, 28, he came to bear our sins and give his life as a ransom. He came to remove sin. That's John 1, 29, 1 John 3, 5. Um, and finally, and very importantly, he came as an example for those who would follow. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29, and throughout the book of Hebrews. Um, so... I'll stop there. There are many, many other things, um, but that gives you an idea. Why did Jesus come? Well, he came with a mission, with a purpose, um, and he uh, was aware that he had a mission and a purpose and came throughout his life to a fuller understanding of that mission and purpose. So the first part of the path to ascension was the full embrace of the understanding that he was here for a larger purpose and the exploration of what that clear purpose was and what it meant and why it mattered now and how he could uh, deliver the message that he was here to bring forth. Um, and in Jesus's case, while we have many of his teachings and he was a teacher and a prophet, uh, he often embodied the teaching. His life was the teaching. Um, yeah, so that's number two. So Jesus didn't just come down, deliver some sermons and, and work some miracles and then zip back up to heaven. Jesus embraced life fully. He lived. He came to experience life as the son of man in human form, in a physical body. He was fully human and he grappled with all the things that we grapple with. The opening of um, John's gospel says that the word, that's Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then um, in Hebrews chapter two, it says, you know, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants, people, us, humanity. It's us that he's here for. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Isn't that beautiful? So he experiences life fully human. You know, he didn't just appear on earth either. He went through the entire process of being human. He was born, you know, he was born in a stable, you know, in the uh, most basic of conditions, in the most ordinary of circumstances to a carpenter. Um, and yeah, there were some miraculous parts of his birth too, but you know, he was born, human birth. He, he wasn't just plopped down here. As an, as an angel might be, um, not to diminish that, but you hear, you hear what I'm saying. He was fully human. He was born. He grew in wisdom and stature. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He felt weak at times. He felt, you know, all that was, was done to him physically. Um, he, he felt things. He thought things. He was troubled in spirit by things. He experienced and expressed emotion things that were very, very human. So examples, his annoyance with crowds and the crowds following him, um, he, his anger at the money changers in the temple, the way he wept at the death of Lazarus. And while this part has been very neatly excised from the record, he loved in every way a man can love. He loved, he laughed. Of all the things I remember about Jesus, and I say remember because I somehow came into this life with the sole recollection of Jesus, the man who walked um, on, on the face of the earth. I remember his laughter, his laugh, and I was extremely human. Um, another thing the church has lost <laughs> in all those dour pictures of Jesus. So um, the third thing I want to say about the process is the full experience of his humanity was also not the end of it. Through this experience of being fully human and understanding what that meant, through that, Jesus gained a level of mastery with his humanity and eventually a full acceptance of his divinity. 
his true nature. He embraced the fullness of life and he transcended aspects of his humanity that would have kept him locked in a paradigm that denied the realization of the kingdom of heaven on earth. In other words, um, he, he tr yeah, he transcended that. He rose above those limited views. He rose ab above the limitations. He began within and he, he examined his own beliefs, his thoughts, his feelings, his, he, his, he w bore witness to all of that in his actions. And the self-mastery of his physical experience was actually a prerequisite of his ascension. He practiced um, detachment. He learned uh, from life itself, from life experience, from other teachers, from community, from solitude, everything. The partaking of life was was informed the experience, but most of all, his connection with the Father from within, um, Father, Mother, Creator, life, his connection from within allowed him. So he practiced detachment, um, and one by one he freed himself of all of the expectations and the attachments to outcome, right up to the moment. Um, and the means of his exit from this world. Right to feeling completely forsaken by God. And at a point when all of his dreams, all that he, his mission and purpose, all he stood for appeared to be a failure. Dying, done, over. There was a fine tuning that was happening within Jesus. And ultimately, it was a free will choice, a clear decision that he made in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he brought himself to a place where he could say, not my will, but thine be done. And that was not an easy thing. Okay, so anytime you've seen some movie or thought it was just not my will, but thine be done. Doop, you know, clouds parted and he, you know, climbed up on the cross. No, that was not it. And I, I think most of us understand this. It was not easy. But it was a choice that he made. And it was a choice for that higher, truer purpose and the truth of who he was. And it was a choice for love. It was the more excellent way. And... It was the making of this choice that allowed him to pass through the gates as our forerunner, as the one who shows us the way to do the same. So let's talk a little bit more about that mastery. What was the mastery about? So Jesus walked in the way of wholeness and he m began to master the demands and the insistency of the human will. That voice, that ego that wants us to... Um, to do it our way, essentially. Um, yes. And he, mastered, he achieved the mastery over the demands of the will through surrender to God's will. Uh, he achieved mastery over the voices of the ego mind and uh, the, you know, the desires to do this, you know, more quickly and seize control of the process. No, he allowed God to lead that process. He achieved mastery over the desires of his heart that might say, I can live this kind of life and because I am who I am and, you know, I can, I can have everything. That was one of the temptations, wasn't it? You, look, you can have everything. Um, but even in Jesus's life, there, there was the, the desires um, of his human heart that uh, he could have allowed that to supersede the uh, service to God, and he did not. There were the limitations of the body, the physical form, um, that he um, certainly grappled with, um, alluded earlier to the tiredness, and um, just the sheer um, strength and reserves it took, and uh, that he did not allow those limitations of the body to stop him 
and you know so he fasted um, and he be again became a master of the uh, desires of the flesh and the, the um, perceived limitations of the body. Um, he also became a master um, over the illusions and the promises of this world and the temptations to give oneself over to that. Um, so let me share a verse um, that kind of sums up this self-mastery process that Jesus went through, that it wasn't just, he didn't just snap his fingers. He went deep and through it. And uh, John 16, chapter 16, verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Again, he has shown us the way. He did not remove himself from the world. He was firmly in the world, in his body, yet he allowed neither of those facts, being in the world, but not of it, um, being in this body, to take on more importance than the flow of divine grace through him. So what did he overcome specifically? Um, he overcame what we refer to as the seven deadly sins, um, which were gluttony, lust, greed, pride, despair, wrath, glory, and sloth. All those common temptations that lead us astray when we are in this human form. He also, in uh, not only did he release all of that, then he embraced what we call the seven virtues, prudence, chastity, temperance, charity, patience, kindness, humility. And the way that um, I am shown that he did this was by, by breaking the seven seals, by opening himself up to the flow of divine will and divine grace, and by um, coming into balance in terms of that life force energy in, in perfecting um, body, mind, heart, spirit, so that that life force energy can flow freely and so that he could draw on what I am shown to be the seven wonders of the soul, which are faith, hope, love, healing, growth, passion, beauty, so that those would flow in as a beautiful river of life. Those streams of soul would come forth. Those seven wonders of the soul would come forth and flow through him and open up a beautiful opportunity for all who were in his presence, for all who would hear his words, for all who would touch him, for all who would see him, for all through all the ages. That is why he is the healer of the ages. He opened himself to that healing process, that maturation process, that coming into oneness with himself process and allowing himself to see that he was one with God. So as Jesus did this, um, as he let go you know, one by one of all of those illusions and the false promises of this world that would keep him bound, he returned more and more to the lightness that was most true to his soul of who he, who he was. And he mastered this energy and he aligned himself so fully with the will of God that his spirit body was revealed and his soul made its journey back home, back to God, back to source. And because he has mastered his transcendence of these perceived limitations and um, that are like built into our earthly reality, our earthly state, he was able to change form. So in fact, these teachings of Jesus that I'm sharing right now were actually integral to his way of moving through this world in, in my understanding. Um, and his closest followers were well aware of this. Many actually practiced this same kind of self-mastery, yet it was perceived by those who were in power in the early days of formalized Christianity as somehow to be on the fringe and not wouldn't it would not be appealing to the masses. And therefore it was eradicated from the record. And this omission of a major part of Jesus' process and his life and his teaching also had to do with the denigration of the feminine. And um, in particularly in embodied form, Mary Magdalene, who taught with Jesus in the desert and later shared these teachings with followers of what she preferred to call the way. And modern day Christianity um, 
you know, has dismissed such an, um, such, um, an important part um, of the story in the life of Jesus that, and it is to me, this part of, he was fully human. He embraced life. He completely said, yes, I, you know, he didn't just think he was here, um, on, you know, a little temporary two year jaunt, uh, or three year jaunt, um, you know, on earth. And then, you know, he's, again, it was, he embraced the experience of his humanity. He lived it. And he still was able to come to that place of inner reconciliation of true peace and to allow the love to flow through him to the point that he said yes to the call of the divine and at all costs and out of love for himself, for God, you know, for those he loved and for all humanity, but it was not easy. Another thing that modern day Christianity has completely oversimplified is the transformation that can occur when we return to God. Um, and this happens, you know, there's this um, belief in a very transactional approach that is based on one-time actions. So make a profession of faith, walk the aisle, get baptized, go to church. For Jesus, calling on the name of God and publicly acknowledging his faith um, and his calling and his mission was the first step. It was step one on a long journey of unfolding and coming home to the wholeness of who he was and, and then making that journey home, that return to God. So the journey from that first step, his life was the true teaching and we miss that. So it's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing dedication to the purity of heart and mind and spirit an emptying, a self-emptying, a cleansing. And that is at the heart of the ascension journey, along with a willingness to be filled with the spirit of God, to rise up into the fullness of that love that comes upon us from within and is revealed uh, as the truth of who we are as we surrender to its flow. And to remember who we are and to embody that remembrance, that's the point. That is the fullness of life. That is the life and the life more abundant. That is freedom. That is the truth that will set you free. There's, there's a radical re reclaiming, a, a rad radical reclamation is the term that I like to use that. It's a reclaiming of the truth that has been there all along, deep in our souls, um, and, but it was covered up. It was buried by our um, beliefs and by our conditioning and by the reality that we the reality that we think uh, is most true. And and so the reclamation of the truth is a big part of ascension. And then that second step is about um, the radiant realization that we individually and collectively were created to play an integral role in the healing of humanity or not only were we created for that purpose um, but we 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 are in this form right now here and now in these bodies in these vessels we are here to play a role in the healing of humanity and the redemption and restoration of God's kingdom, of God's creation, by becoming full participants in its recreation, active here, now. We have a role to play. And to in order to fulfill that role, we must, again, make this journey of ascension. We have been invited to be the light of the world, to be the bread of life, to be the love of God. Each of us uniquely drawing on our own soul's remembrance through the process of ascending into the wholeness of who we are. And along the, along the journey of ascension, which is essentially a journey back to God and the whole of who we are, we're going to face all of those ego traps that Jesus faced, many of which are recorded in scripture. You know, the temptation to misuse power, the temptation to chuck the mission and retreat into bliss, the temptation to allow our emotions to spill over and out, um, the temptation to uh, create a world of our own making, 
pretending that we're in control and merely giving lip service to God, though all those temptations we are going to face on this journey. The journey, the journey to ascension that Jesus showed us is about allowing ourselves to be formed and reformed and transformed. It's about the renewing of our minds and spirits, the renewing of this body, the renewing of our heart, the remembrance. And um, it happens from within, from the inside out. And it happens only as we are fully connected to and engaged with life not standing outside of it, not separating ourselves. And this is the mistake that much of the spiritual community uh, makes, which is that we are somehow above it all and separate from it all. No, 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 we are, we are one with life. And yet there is a sorting out that must happen. And we must see, we must, we must um, see that we have the capacity to rise above and allow ourselves to be raised above and transcend the uh, perceived limitations of this life and the illusions that are there in this life. So let me uh, go ahead and talk a little bit briefly, this is a long video, about the true meaning of Jesus' ascension and why it matters now. So first of all, I do believe it was a model for us, as I believe all the ways Jesus moved through this life and world were a model for us. Um, he taught us to walk in the way. And the ascension is also significant because it's a marker. It is the end of Jesus' earthly ministry um, and the beginning of his reign with God from the heavenly realms. And the ascension, it's, it's a completion and a culmination um, and a return to that radiance and to glory. You know, Jesus was exalted and lifted up by God and... It is also a continuation. He's not just sitting up there on a throne, you know, inactive, waiting for the end of time. Jesus, his continuing acts of grace, his continued spilling out of life and light and love upon this world, his continued um, giving of the spirit, the life-giving spirit, all of that continues from his current form as one who has ascended. And, you know, he, to he told the disciples he would be going to prepare a place. And the book of Hebrews, in, uh, in, in, uh, specifically, this is elsewhere as well, but um, says he would serve as a great high priest and as mediator of the new covenant, a new covenant, God's new covenant with humanity made possible through the fulfillment of Jesus' mission on earth, you know, his particular calling. And so he's active. The story isn't over with the ascension. Jesus, you know, it said, will return to establish a new heaven and a new earth. And throughout the Bible, and the biblical witness in a variety of Old Testament and New Testament scriptures, the sacred texts say he will return just as he left in bodily form and visibly in the clouds. Um, I, you know, that's, that's what it says. And um, so I do tend to believe that in some form that will happen. Um, I also believe he has in this continuing ministry um, once he had ascended, I believe he um, has um, been working with many of us here in this time as we are undergoing that process of ascension to raise us up to be witnesses here on earth and to assist in the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth. So ascension is for us, just as it was for Jesus, a great return. It is a return to the whole truth of who we are, and it's a return to our home in God. That longing for, for God is fulfilled because we understand. We come to that place of reunion in, within our hearts. 
and our souls. And it's a continued unfolding, right? It's not just that we arrive. It is a continued process, a continuation. And we continue to be of more and more service on this path of ascension. And as we shed everything that's not true, we return to the full embrace of our souls as at rest and complete, complete in the love of God and in this life, this life, this life that we are, we are one with and we purify it. Um, let me see if there's anything else I'd like to say about that. Yeah, there's, let's see, as we, so there's a surrendering process, this shedding, this opening up, this release of all our desire to control the way things go. As we surrender and open up to the truth and the light shining through the darkness, that truth and that light that we you know, often fail to see and understand because we've been conditioned to believe in limitation and weakness rather than the full radiance of who we are. So as we make that journey and we see, maybe as through a glass dimly, right, or darkly, we um, begin to see that we are one with that light, that there is no separation. We soon, in that process, we realize we are being changed and have been changed. There comes a revelation. And that revelation is a mystery and we, we can never quite understand it. Um, and yet we can surrender to it and allow it to change us from the inside out in all ways. So ultimately it comes down to choice. So what will we choose? Will we choose, what will we choose this day, today, in every day? What will we choose? Will we choose to see ourselves as God sees us? Or are we going to remain hellbent on punishment and self-deprecation and telling ourselves that we are not deserving of this or, and we're not up to making the difficult changes that must be made if we are to allow the grace of God to reveal the full radiance of who we are? What are we going to tell ourselves? What's the story we're going to believe? What are we going to choose to do? Will we take action or will we take the easy way out? Jesus often said his teachings were for those who have eyes to see. Do we see? Jesus said he would come again, and he said he was re preparing a place for us. And I truly believe we are fortunate enough to be living in a time when that preparation is nearly complete. Those who have gone before us, whose bodies have died, will um, participate in, in this revelation um, if, they, if their souls made that choice or choose to make that choice. But Jesus never suggested that we were just to attend to our own process and then sit around waiting for him to appear on a white horse. Uh, in fact, he spoke very often of our active tending to that care of our souls, to what mattered most, to what had been entrusted to us, to all that must be brought forth from within us, no matter how much it terrifies us, to all that is in need of love and healing, and to all which calls to be set free today. So what's calling in you to be set free, to be brought forth, to be healed, to be brought into its fullness, to be surrendered? Ascension is about life, life, living in full expression. It's about the life that waits for us inside these vessels that are our bodies. And the journey of ascension is not for the faint of heart, it does require a commitment to that which is unseen as of now. And that is God's power at work within us. And if we think we are directing our own ascension, then uh, we will likely be drawn off the path of ascension. So I hope this has been helpful and there's been something here for you. I am going to close by reading um, a passage that I particularly love from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So listen to what is here for you. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show us that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is in, at work in you. Life is at work in you. This is ascension. The end of that passage says this, It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen? Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal.